Okay, so we are happy to have Marcus uh, Sperling uh, from Yale Center. He's going to tell us about the Higgs round sheets, magnetic quivers, and the Hasse diagrams. Uh, okay, hello, and uh, thank everyone for coming. First of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing the seminar to Satoshi and for giving me the opportunity to present this work here. Um, so today is going to be um, sort of a summary and an overview on the recent project I've been working on with uh, Amya Hayanani and uh, his uh, postdocs and PhD students in London. And the central question that we're interested in is to study modular spaces of supersymmetric gauge theory. And uh, as we know, the geometry of these modular spaces is heavily influenced by the amount of supersymmetry that we have. And in, in this kind of uh, work, we focus on modular spaces which have hypercalar uh, geometry. And we have, for instance, two of examples of known examples uh, which have a hypercalar geometry. One of them are the Higgs branches. And here we can be very uh, generous in the dimension. We can go from dimension three to six and only demand that the amount of supersymmetry is eight. And then we have the condition that the uh, modular space is a hypercalar space. And the features of these hyper, of these Higgs branch are particularly nice in the sense that we have non randomization theorems, meaning that the modular space is classically exact and we can simply express it as uh, the vanishing locus of the F and D terms uh, divided by the gauge group, which then tells us that this kind of modular space, if we have a Lagrangian theory to begin with, can be described by a hypercalar quotient. On the other side, we can also look at uh, modular spaces which are known as Coulomb branch, but here we have to be more restrictive in order to get the hypercalar geometry, meaning that we have to go to 3D and it's four. And in, in contrast to the Higgs branch, the Coulomb branch geometry is much more uh, uh, sophisticated or let's say subtle in the sense that we do have quantum corrections which severely change the classical results compared to the full quantum corrected uh, space. So one of the first questions that you need to ask yourself is what is a good set of coordinates that allows you to describe the cargo ring of this uh, full quantum corrected model space. And here it came to the understanding that uh, just monopole operators are actually the, the operators that you need in order to describe the entire Coulomb branch. And geometrically, we now understand the Coulomb branch as a syntactic singularity, which is another way of saying we have a hypercalar singularity. And from this sort of uh, simple overview, you would uh, guess that Coulomb branches are very difficult and Higgs branches seem a bit more uh, tame. Uh, but there's actually a very nice question that you can ask. What happens if you take the, the gauge coupling to infinity? Uh, what happens to the Higgs branch? And taking the gauge coupling to infinity, we, we do not expect that the amount of supersymmetry is going to be diminished. So we still expect the space to be a hypercalar space. And we have known uh, examples where the geometry of the Higgs branch at infinite coupling changes dramatically. For instance, if you uh, look at the 60 n equals 1, 0 theory, there we have the uh, arisal of tension as strings. And we have, for instance, the known phenomena of the small E8 in some transition, which changes the modular space uh, precisely by 29 quaternionic dimensions. Uh, if you, for instance, are interested in five dimensional theories, as I'm going to be mainly in this talk today, there we have so-called instanton operators. And we know for the uh, example of SU2 with NF flavors, that the classical modular space is just a D-type nearpotent orbit, while at the infinite coupling or at the UV fixed point, we know that the modular space is the one instanton modular space. So we already, there are already known examples on how uh, that a modular space can change at infinite coupling. But now the question is, how can we uh, study this more systematically? And here is actually the point where the coordinate branch is becoming very, very handy. Because the proposed answer to uh, how we address is crucially building on the extensive research that has been uh, conducted recently on, on Coulomb branches. So there's on the one hand side, of course, the physics approach, um, where you can either go on abelianization or you can go to a Hilbert series approach, or also the extensive research recently by mathematicians, um, for instance, Iraqo and the authors. And the proposed answer for today, or the, the proposed uh, topic, actually contains two steps. The first one gives you a direct answer for the Higgs branch. And here, the, the central object is a magnetic quiver, which is something that we can derive from, for instance, a brain configuration. And then it is taken as an, as an input data, so it's considered as a combinatorial object, such that I can evaluate the, the Coulomb branch of this uh, object and say this is a valid description of my Higgs branch at infinite coupling as seen as an equality of the modular space. You can also turn this around and say, uh, if I have a, a, a modular space, or if I have a space which is a symplectic singularity, and if I find uh, an object, a magnetic quiver, such that the Coulomb branch is precisely describing this uh, symplectic singularity, then this is one 
way of saying this is a magnetic group. So it, actually, it can happen that uh, a single modular space can have multiple magnetic groups, which lead to the same conclusion. And uh, this series of works uh, we uh, started in uh, 2018, 2019, first with uh, Army High student uh, Santiago, and recently we have uh, uh, completed the work on five dimensional theories, which is the main focus of today's talk. And the second part is then once we know what is a good description or what, what is a valid description of the Higgs branch identity coupling, we can even go further and ask uh, can we know more about the geometry of the modular space, meaning can we look at the singularity structure? And here, a very uh, powerful tool is what's called, or what we call the Hassa diagram, meaning that we know, for instance, from uh, Newport and Orbit examples, that symplectic singularities uh, allow uh, foliation or stratification into what's called a symplectic field. And then these are ordered, so we can put them in a, in a Hassa diagram. And in between an ordered pair of symplectic leaves, there's, a, there's an, an, a transfer space, which is called a slice. And uh, the interesting point is that all of these spaces, so the, the closures of the leaves as well as the slices, they are all symplectic singularities or hyperkähler singularities. So we can have now the aim that we want to describe every possible uh, piece in this Hassa diagram via magnetic group. And uh, this at the moment might sound a bit uh, much, but I, I and, and the rest of the talk is basically divided into two parts. The first part is going to show you how you can derive a magnetic quiver and what it means to have a magnetic quiver. And the second part shows you how we can then use all this information that we learned about modular spaces to write down the Hassel diagram and extract information from this. So the first uh, part is then devoted to five dimensional theories as a concrete example. And here the, the literature on five dimensional n equals one theories is uh, quite extensive. There are many different approaches that you can take. Here I'm gonna focus on the engineering via five in reps in type 2b, which has well, one of the advantages is that you can simultaneously uh, consider the information about the UV fixed points as well as the gauge theory dynamics. Um, and this kind of setup, uh, a very extensively studied subject is the enhancement of the global symmetry uh, at the UV fixed point, which is usually argument due to, to uh, which is argued to be due to the instanton operators, which are charged on the this additional uh, topologically one symmetry, which we have in five dimensions. Um, but similarly, you can ask also the question, what about the entire uh, enhancement of the Higgs branch if there's an enhancement? And this question is a bit more, uh, well, it's a bit more recent because we have the, the first uh, systematic studies of uh, uh, SU, uh, SQCD in, uh, in five dimensions were only conducted like a couple of years ago. And already in these first studies, it, came, it became apparent that the Coulomb branch is or a Coulomb branch of a 3D N equals 4 theory is a very nice object that helps you to understand uh, the behavior of these six branches of infinite coupling, which has then subsequently led to the first proposal of a magnetic quiver in the work by Santiago, Amihai, and uh, Futoshi. And then you can ask essentially a, a very similar question. If I now want to go to symplectic or orthogonal gauge groups, then in terms of five and webs, it means that I have to include some, some type of oriented group. And here for the for the possible or the, the classification of the existence of conformal uh, fixed points in five dimensions um, is proposed already in 97 from the field theory point of view and then subsequently from the brain webs. But also recently it has been argued that this classification can be uh, their, their new fixed point. And this is gonna be the main uh, starting point that we start from these five brain webs with all the intervals. And we want to ask the simple question, what happens to the Higgs branch with infinite coupling for these theories? So the aim is just, uh, can we improve the understanding of these syntactic singularities by using the tool of magnetic quivers. So now I've talked a lot about the magnetic quiver, but first of all, uh, we need to review some rules for brain configurations, which are gonna be the central object in order to derive a magnetic quiver. So we start by working with type two brain configurations, which uh, correspond or which are comprised of N's five brains, BP and BP plus two brains. And they are arranged such that we have uh, eight remaining supercharges. And the notation for the brains is gonna be an NS5, it's got a cross circle, a DP is a line, and the DP plus two is a circle. And a brain configuration can now be presented in different uh, phases by just moving the, the brains sort of around. And for, the, for those kind of configurations or for those kinds of movements that we take, there are certain rules which are necessary in order to preserve um, the supersymmetric configurations. So for instance, one is, if we have an NS5 brain and a, D7, uh, a DP plus two brain connected by a, a couple of DP brains, the number of DP brains can only be zero or one, otherwise it's not gonna be a supersymmetric configuration. Similarly, 
A, if you have an M-swipe and the DP, plus, the DP plus two, which are connected by a single DP, you can ask what is happening if I want to transition the M-swipe to the DP plus two. And here, in order to preserve um, all the brain charges correctly, you have to annihilate it with the corresponding brain. So if you reverse the process, you're gonna have brain correction. And lastly, if you now want to take the step that you include oriented folds, then there are additional rules. For instance, that the oriented fold, uh, the character of the oriented fold can change if you cross a half and a five brain or if you cross a DP plus two brain. But so these rules are necessary for the following reason. Um, usually, if you would like to have a brain configuration, it would be uh, convenient to read off the uh, conventional Kurba theory or the electric theory. Then you would prefer a phase which you can call the electric phase, meaning that the DP brains are suspended between the NS fives. But we also know that we can directly read off the Higgs branch or we can count the Higgs branch dimensions if we change the brain configuration into the phase where the Higgs branch directions are visible, meaning that if we suspend in DP brains between DP plus two brains, then the motion or the, the motion of the DP brains uh, along the DP plus two but transfers for the NS5 brains, they precisely give us the Higgs branch of the freedom. So then you can ask, um, is this phase actually also very useful in order to derive the magnetic curve itself? And as it turns out, the answer is yes. Um, so here's a, a couple of rules that we propose in order to read out what is a magnetic curve. So on the left-hand side, I'm gonna depict that the, the, the phase of the brain configuration that is the one convention for reading of the, the low energy effective theory and some sort of equivalent description, meaning we have the P brains between and five brains. Uh, and this in, in six and five dimensions uh, would give you an SUK. If you, for instance, go to three dimensions, you would get a UK cage group. Now, if you want to change the brain configuration to having K, the P brain suspended between DP plus two brains, we now propose that from this stack of DP brains, we would read off the UK magnetic H group. Uh, similarly, or oh, are there any questions around this? Because this is the, the, the crucial step that we can, at this point, we propose that we, we transfer the, the brain configuration into the Higgs branch phase, and we now we start assigning what to read from the spring configuration in terms of the magnetic curve. Okay. If we now want to include an oriented fold, we again have to start on the electric side. So here we have the usual convention that if you have an, uh, a stack of uh, physical uh, DP brains on top, for instance, an OP minus brain, then we would get a physical SO2K or an electric SO2K uh, gauge group. If we change it to a um, uh, minus tilde, we would get a B-type algebra and on plus and plus tilde, we obtain a C-type uh, electric algebra. Now, the same, just by replacing the NS5 via uh, DP plus two brains, now we need to wonder how, how should we propose uh, to read us a magnetic algebra. And the, the, the claim or the proposal that we have is that we need to change the character of the uh, orient default in order to read off the magnetic gauge group, meaning we still have so here you see the notation is still the same. So there's still nothing, there's a solid line, there's a dashed line. So the, the, the brain is still the same. We only change the character when reading off the magnetic group. And the way we change it is inspired from either uh, the S duality of O3 or in different planes, or if you want from the GNO duality. Meaning if I have uh, a stack of DP brains on top of an uh, electric OP minus brain, then the OP minus remains an OP minus in the magnetic sense. And I read of a D type uh, magnetic algebra, meaning I have a gene duality between D and D, which is the, the one we expect. In contrast, if you have a minus tilde electric plane, then we would say the magnetic one is just a plus plane, meaning we have a C-type uh, magnetic algebra. And similarly, in converse, if I sub it in a plus one, I get a minus tilde plane on the magnetic side. And then you see these two lines are essentially telling you there's a duality between uh, B-type algebra and the C-type algebra on the electric and magnetic side. And lastly, we have the plus tilde plane, which on the magnetic side remains a plus tilde plane, so we have the uh, remaining gene orality. And from these uh, rules, we can now read off the magnetic uh, gauge groups and the magnetic by fundamentals, which are then gonna connect the magnetic gauge group to build a magnetic quiver, are then read off from uh, the intersection numbers. But this is gonna be the subject of the next example. Okay, now we're gonna be more explicit and focus on a first example of five brain webs. And here I'm gonna choose a five brain web in the presence of an O7 neutron. The reason is gonna be apparent in a moment. So if we want to engineer 
uh, a five-pin web which gives us at low energies an SPK gauge theory with a number of fundamental flavors using an O7 brain, then the uh, five-pin web looks something like this. So the O7 uh, orientable plane is this crossed uh, is this cross here. Then we have these lines are all now five brains and the slopes. They correspond to different, um, well, the slope essentially tells you what kind of PQ brain you have. And the circles are the seven brains in this example. And here we have chosen to terminate all the semi-infinite five brains on seven brains. So what you see here is you have a stack of K, uh, the five brains on top of the antifold. So this stack of K brains gives you the SPK gauge group, while the, uh, these half the seven brains on the left and the right hand side, they give rise to the flavor uh, to the number of flavors in low energies. And the red dotted line are the monotonic cuts. What we then know from this brain configuration that at the quantum level we can resolve the O7 to uh, two uh, mutually non-local seven brains. So for example, we can choose uh, a one one and a one minus one brain. If we then choose this resolution, then we see that we can transform the brain web into a five pin web. Uh, with seven brains only, so there are no further oriented folds, which is then very convenient because we can transfer this uh, brain configuration into, into a brain configuration which is much nicer to read the magnetic river, meaning we transfer it into the Higgs branch phase. That means we want to suspend, uh, we want to suspend all of the five brains between uh, seven brains only. So what we can do is we can uh, turn around the monotony cuts and transition the seven brains to the five brains using brain creation which then leads us to this uh, brain configuration. And lastly, setting uh, all the masses to zero, we obtain um, this following configuration, which is now a, a very nice brain configuration of five brains solely suspended between seven, uh, between seven brains, no orient defaults anymore, which uh, is then very fortunate because now we can simply go back to the, to the rules that's already been worked out by Santiago, Amihara, and Hitoshi, meaning now we're gonna get a unitary magnetic group and the unitary magnetic quiver is sort of a warm-up exercise to tell you how to, how to read the magnetic quiver in a more complicated setting later. So let's see how this works in the example of SP1 with seven flavors. Here, the, if I just turn on all the numbers, you're going to see that the five-frame web is going to be looking like this. And the numbers here, one, two, seven, six, this just means how many physical five brains are suspended in between because I don't want to draw them all. Now, the question is, how do we get the magnetic quiver? For this, we need to uh, remind ourselves how do we read or how do we count the Higgs branch dimensions in a brain web. That means now we need to decompose the five brain web into subwebs, which can independently move along the seven brains into the direction which is uh, transverse to the paper. So if we do that, we have to deal with a maximal subdivision, meaning what is the possible subdivision that we can find. And here I they call out everything uh, which is necessary for the subdivision. And if you just start counting how many uh, independent uh, Higgs branch directions there are, you find there are 11 quaternionic dimensions. But now we can go ahead and actually not just assign a number to this decomposition, but we can actually assign a quiver to this. And the way we do it is we, we just, um, to each individual subweb, we assign, if there's multiplicity one, we just assign one uh, magnetic cation. So for instance, the red piece here, you see it's a very long red piece, but it's just one web that has to move together. Uh, and similarly, for instance, you see uh, the two here, the two in green. So there are two um, five brains which are suspended between the seven, uh, between the, the same five, uh, the seven brains, but there are two identical copies. So here they're going to contribute a magnetic gauge of about two. So this is the first step. The second step is now how do we assign uh, magnetic bifundamentals between uh, these gauge nodes? But here comes the, the, the point where we have to compute intersection numbers. And the intersection number is composed of two uh, points. One is the intersection number between five brains. So if you, for instance, look at the intersection of the red and the black um, subgroup here, they have an intersection in terms of five brains. So I just compute what is the intersection between a PQ five brain and a P prime Q prime five brain. But then this, uh, this intersection number is then modified by uh, the seven brains, if they have seven brains in common, they end on. And we see here that they have a seven brain in common here and a seven brain in common here. And since they end on the same side of the seven brain, the, the positive contribution from the intersection number here is going to be cancelled by uh, this uh, use of the same seven brain uh, from the same side. That means that this red node is not going to be connected to this black node here. 
And the same argument goes through for all of these webs in here. And we see that the, the red web, for instance, is only connected with a, bi uh, with a magnetic bar fundamental uh, to this subweb here, because here we see the red brain ends on, this, on the same seven brain as the black one, but they end on opposite side, meaning they get a positive uh, intersection. So long story short, if you do this exercise uh, carefully, then you're gonna find that all the magnetic gauge nodes that we just found earlier have to be connected in this uh, form, which is already a very suggestively looking uh, object because we, we recognize this is a Dinkin diagram of an affine uh, D7. And if you don't compute the, the Kuhner bunch, which is a known thing, you find it's gonna be the minimum dependent orbit of D7, which correctly agrees with the expectation of the Higgs bunch at finer coupling of sp one with seven plane. Any questions about this first example of a magnetic orbit? Okay. If you move the infinite coupling, we have to rearrange the brain web a bit. But if you do this carefully and then perform the decomposition into subwebs, you're going to find uh, a similar by a similar exercise the following uh, nodes. And if you simply start counting how many Higgs bunch dimensions there are, we find there are going to be 29. Now, 29 is already quite suggestive, but now adding the magnetic bar fundamentals by computing the intersection numbers, we find the curva is actually in a finely Dinkin diagram, telling us that the Coulomb branch of this object is nothing else than the minimal independent orbit of the eight, which perfectly fine agrees with what we already know from SP1 with seven flavors at infinite coupling. Okay, so this was a sort of recall on how to get a magnetic curva in the case where there's no oriented group present. Now we're going to move to a more uh, complicated, more a more sophisticated setting uh, where you need a bit more rules and where the computations are a bit more tricky, in the sense that we have now five brains with an O5 uh, or in different brain. So the brain configuration looks very similar, except that now instead of an O7, we have uh, an O5 plane. The notation that uh, I've used is that this dotted line here is an O5 uh, plus plane, giving us the symplectic gauge group here. And this nothingness here on the left and the right hand side is the notation that we have chosen for the uh, O5 minus brain. As before, this stack of K, uh, D5 brains here gives you the symplectic gauge group and all of the semi-infinite uh, five brains that would usually go to infinity have been terminated on seven brains such that we can read off the numbers of flavors uh, by just su uh, summing up the numbers on the left hand side and the right hand side. Um, this brain configuration is usually the one that is very suitable for reading of the electric theory, but now again, we need to move to the Higgs branch phase, meaning that we turn off all the masters and all the Coulomb branch parameters. So we have to force all the uh, color brains to the antifold as well as all the, uh, as well as all the flavor seven brains, which then turns us into this configuration for the Higgs branch. And, and again, the specific example I want to show you is again the E8 example. So we start from a, a brain configuration that looks like this and be transferred into the Higgs branch phase, which then becomes something like this. So now is again the question, how do we start by, or how do we get the number of Higgs branch degrees of freedom from a brain configuration like this? Um, the first starting point is that we have to observe these uh, brains in the middle. So these are the, the only five brains which have a non-vanishing NS charge. And we see that this is a 1,1 this here is a 1,1 five brain, which is by itself, it's not a supersymmetric configuration, so we need it to be connected to three physical uh, five brains on the left-hand side, but then three physical five brains on the left-hand side need to be determined or need to, to be, need to terminate on seven brains, but they cannot terminate all on the same seven brains, so they need to terminate on a seven brain one after another, which means that we have a couple of frozen brains because it's a, it's a five brain between a, a brain that carries an S charge and a seven brain. A similar argument goes over here. We have a 0, 0,1, which is not uh, a supersymmetric configuration by itself, so it needs to be connected to two five brains, two physical five brains on the right hand side. So if we now want to go to the X one trace, it's most convenient if we just annihilate everything that is a, in a frozen brain. And annihilating that is nothing else than moving the brains around and taking care of brain annihilation. Such that in the end of the day, we're gonna find this configuration. Here, now you see that all these numbers, four, three, two, they have diminished to one because the rest of these numbers were basically comprised of frozen brains. And the slope of, the, uh, of these brains have changed because we have crossed a couple of monotonic cards. 
But now this configuration is a perfectly fine uh, hex bunch phase because we now can simply count what are the hex bunch degrees of freedom. We can just count all these ones here and we're gonna find the number of hex bunch degrees of freedom in quaternionic units is 11, which is already very, very reassuring because that's the answer that we expect. Now we can go further and again start to read off the magnetic quiver from this uh, configuration. And the exercise is essentially the same as before. We need to find a maximum subdivision plus we need to compute intersection numbers with the only new complication or sort of added difficulty that we have to convert the electric oriented poles to the magnetic ones before we want to read off the uh, magnetic quiver. So if we want to do this uh, in this example, we see that a subdivision here is essentially very simple because all of these uh, stacks of five pins on the orientifold, they all constitute independent subjects because they can move transfers to the paper direction and they all um, end on seven planes. And if we have uh, two adjacent stacks, they end on the same seven plane, but from different sides. So they're gonna have a positive contribution. So there's a single magnetic hypermagnetism too. Such that from all these colored planes, which are on the orientifold, we will just read off this uh, alternating autosymplectic uh, gauge groups uh, in this fashion here. And now the only thing that you may wonder about is what is happening with the 1,1 and the 1,1 minus 1 planes. But if you uh, look at them closely, they are not, although they're supersymmetric configurations by themselves, they cannot move along the seven plane. They, they cannot move in the transverse direction. So they are sort of stuck in their position. Therefore, they do not contribute Higgs bunch to of freedom but we still have a non-trivial intersection between this brain and uh, the brain segment here. So we just compute that there's a one magnetic Kuiper multiplet with a flavor node B0, which essentially means that there's a single uh, half Kuiper multiplet connected to the C1 node. Now, this is the first part. The first part is now we have a magnetic quiver for this brain configuration. The second exercise is to actually compute the modular space, uh, which belongs to this quiver. And for this, we are fortunately uh, lucky enough because this is already a known uh, case. So this is an autosymplectic realization of the minimum dependent orbit of these, of these seven, which again matches the Higgs bunch at the infinite couple, uh, at final couple. Okay, so far so good. Now we can again move on to the infinite coupling phase. If we wanna move to infinite coupling, we first of all need to resolve this potential intersection here because we now want to take this distance between the NS carrying charge to zero. So first, we're gonna resolve this intersection uh, in a fashion like this. And now, taking the gauge capping to infinity means nothing else, so we're just gonna collapse these seven brains onto the empty fold uh, itself. So we're gonna end up with a brain configuration that looks like this. Now, from this uh, configuration, it's the same exercise as before. We start computing what is the maximal subdivision. We need to compute intersection numbers. Here, um, the piece, which is on the empty fold, it's essentially uh, an upgraded exercise from before. So we have uh, stacks of uh, a single five pin here, a single five pin here, and now we have multiplicity. But multiplicity we, need, we know how to take care of. It just means that we increase the rank of the magnetic gauge group. The only new ingredient is this blue piece in the middle. What it means is that we have two uh, NS5 brains which are connected or which are suspended between seven brains which cross the oriented fold uh, transversally. That means, uh, since it crosses the orientifold default transversely, the, the character of the resulting magne uh, magnetic gauge group is reversed. Here, we have a, an O5 minus plane, which remains an O5 minus in the magnetic gauge, uh, magnetic uh, orientifold, default, and the, uh, the transverse uh, projection gives you a symplectic gauge group. That means on top of uh, the D4, we're gonna add a C1. Okay. So first step taken, we have computed or we have derived a magnetic quiver from a brain configuration, which is supposed to be the infinite coupling of sp1 with seven flavors. Next step is we need to compute what is the actual modular space. And here comes the small subtlety, because now we have to work with a, a unframed autosymplectic magnetic quiver, where there are some uh, subtleties involved in how to choose the magnetic gauge groups. Um, so this is uh, the first thing to have to worry about, but here, we already know that the same magnetic quiver appears for the East Ring. Um, that means that this magnetic quiver was first proposed by uh, Amihai and Mapadol. And then we have derived it together with Santiago from a brain configuration that describes the six dimensional N equals one case. So we already know, okay, this is very promising. Second, uh, we also know that this 
magnetic quiver is related to uh, the class S description of a sphere with two maximal and one minimal puncture of SO8, which then basically means that this uh, leg on the right hand side and this leg on the left hand side is uh, an, a maximal partition for SO8 in the T for sigma description, and this is a minima, uh, which have been put together, so which is known to be the description of an E8SCP. And lastly, we have an explicit Hilbert series validation of the claim that this object describes the minimal knee pattern of the V8, which is uh, first of all done by uh, Zheng Hao, who's in the audience in his master thesis, and is going to be uh, explained in much more detail in an upcoming paper, such that the conclusion is finally that the magnetic quiver we read from the brain configuration in the presence of orientable planes is indeed describing us the minimal knee pattern of the V8 as it should in order to match the Higgs bunch at infinite coupling of SP1 with seven flavors. Okay, so what we have seen so far is that there's a prescription that tells you how to read a magnetic quiver. And in some cases you have to work more, in other cases you have to work less in order to really figure out what is the modern space. And this is essentially the first part of the answer to what is the Higgs bunch at infinite coupling. Because now we give you a prescription of how to compute the Higgs bunch. And it, it actually turns out that this prescription is, uh, is a very, uh, potent one, because now you can go to anything that has a brain configuration and you can start reading of a magnetic quiver. And in many cases, you can even uh, find new predictions for Higgs bunches at finite coupling. For instance, if there's no complete Higgsing, then the, the usual Higgs bunch computation is quite a hassle, but the magnetic quiver gives you a nice prediction for what this Higgs bunch should be. Are there any questions about this magnetic quiver part at the moment? Can I ask about notation? So you write, you wrote C1 and D1, which group are you? To, uh, right, are right. You? So here C1, I just mean USP2. And USP2. here we write D4, it's just SO8. How about D1? Uh, D1 is just SO2. SO2, okay, thank you. And yeah, notation is just to, you know, give a clear visual distinction to uh, uh, anything that is a conventional quiver. Any further questions? Okay, now let's go to the second part, to Hassel diagrams. And first I wanna give you a, a sort of a physics version of what is a Hassel diagram in terms of a, a Higgs mechanism for something that is a theory, which is a Lagrangian theory. We have a gauge group and we have some meta content for which we know there is a Higgs bunch. And the Higgs bunch, I just wanted to denote to be the space between these two points for, for some reason. And now, we have a Lagrangian theory, so we can start asking questions about uh, a traditional Higgs mechanism. So suppose that we have a subgroup of the gauge group um, to which we can con consistently Higgs, meaning we decompose the representations of G with respect to a, uh, representations of H, and then a consistent assignment of vacuum expectation values is possible if uh, the conditions on the multiplicities is satisfied, meaning that there's no, uh, that you can absorb all the uh, the necessary modes. And now what, you, what, you, what we know is if we have a gauge group and we have subgroups to which we can consistently Higgs, all these possible groups, they are partially ordered simply by inclusion. And the example here I would like to say is we have a gauge group, we have just one non-trivial group to which we can Higgs and everything else is, the, is completely broken. And they are partially ordered by inclusion because the trivial group is certainly included into anything that's non-trivial and H is included in G by a definition. So this is already a first indication of a Hassel diagram simply by a partial order. But we can make, we can add more meat to it by uh, now looking what is happening in terms of the Higgs bunch. So if we, if we follow the suggestions notation here, means I'm gonna denote the origin of the Higgs bunch at, at this point here, and here the gauge group is not broken at all. If I then move onto a sublocus of the Higgs bunch on which the gauge group is just broken to H, then I know that above each point of this uh, sublocus of the Higgs bunch, there's still a residual gauge theory, which is precisely this H gauge theory with some meta content alpha. And this theory has a Higgs bunch, which is precisely this piece. Um, and then you can ask, okay, wh what is this, uh, this object here? This is what's called a, uh, what's this called a, a symplectic leaf. So the, um, this is the, the assignment of vacuum expectation values which break G to H. And we can also describe it in terms of the, the Higgs mechanism here, we see that the symplectic leaf is parameterized by a number of gauge singlets, and the precise number of gauge singlets is given by the number of singlets that appear in the decomposition of the representation minus the ones that come from the adjoint. 
Okay, so that's uh, already a, a nice thing. But now we can complete the, the Hasselberg again because we can now add the remaining pieces. So by the same by the same argument, we can also now look at the symplectic leaf or the assignment of vector excitation values, which break the gate group completely. And this is essentially this distance here. And, and we see um, the distance look, looks surprisingly similar to the entire hex range, which is consistent because if we take uh, the closure of the leaf where the gauge group is broken completely, then we have included all possible subloci of uh, assignments of vector excitation value, and we recover the entire Higgs branch. Uh, and then the notation is that uh, these objects or these um, these spaces, which are parameterized by the vector excitation values, are what's called the symplectic leaves, which are also partially ordered. And the space in between, so to any ordered pair, we can assign a transfer slice. And the transfer slice, as we see here, is nothing else than the hex bunch of the residual gauge group. Lastly, we can even give a, a nice physical interpretation or a, a, another physical interpretation for the remaining slice, which is uh, again given by hex bunch, but now it's the hex bunch for the theory that is the has a gauge group the commutant of H inside G, which by the hex mechanism has to have the same, has to have the dimension given by the number of singlets appearing in the decomposition of the joint. And it has a number of hypers, and the number of hypers is given by the decomposition here. Um, so in this sense, if we have a classical theory which has a Lagrangian description, uh, the Hassel diagram can essentially be completely understood, or can be completely understood by partial Higgsing. So in this sense, it's a very physical object. Uh, to be uh, more on the uh, geometric side, we can also speak about this a bit more abstract. We can say. Uh, what we describe is a symplectic singularity, and we know a symplectic singularity admits a foliation or stratification into these symplectic leaves. They have certain properties. For instance, they are mutually disjoint, but they are nonetheless partially ordered, and partially ordered is again by inclusion. And this partial order already gives you uh, the possibility to arrange everything in terms of a Hassel diagram, because a Hassel diagram is nothing else than a diagram that contains a part or depicts a partial order. But what is important is that the closures of these symplectic leaves, they are uh, symplectic singularities. So something that we could aspire to describe by a mathematical. Similarly, uh, for any ordered pair, we can look at the transfer space of the smaller leaf into the closure of the larger one. And this is nothing else than what's called the transfer slice, which is again a symplectic singularity. To give a more familiar example, if we want to consider nearpotent orbit closures and you would like to consider the maximum nearpotent orbit, then the foliation of this maximum nearpotent orbit is nothing else than all the possible uh, smaller uh, nearpotent orbits of the same length. And for nearpotent orbits, it's very nice classification, which has already been conducted in the 80s, that tell you that the minimal transfer slices, uh, they can only fall into two classes. They can either be Kleinian singularities or they can be minimal nearpotent orbit closures. Which, which is a very uh, uh, a nice classification, and you can explicitly verify that this is also happening in all the physical theories which describe um, nearpotent orbit closures as their uh, modular space. Uh, so now, in terms of what we do, so in terms of mechanical curves, there question. is actually, sorry? Can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, in the previous slide. So this transfer slice, it corresponds to the Slodowy's uh, slides in the case of this That's uh, new potent orbit. Yes. And this LK, this uh, simple leaves are this, this quadjoint orbit, and then they are classified as Jordan matrix and so on. Right, right, right. So okay, you have okay. the maximal one, and then you have all the possible partitions below, and they can okay. be. And you know, okay. they are, mm -hmm. the, the, the new potent orbits are mutually disjoint. Mm -hmm. But one is contained in the in the uh, closure because the the smaller ones are precisely at the singular locus of the big ones. Okay, okay, I see. And you have more general version by using Hassel diagram. Right, right, right. That's okay. the point okay. where okay. we actually have to extend this piece. Okay. Because this classification is of course only valid for nearpotent orbits. It does not have to be true for anything which is more generic. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so in terms of magnetic curves, we have a sort of a nice algorithm that is based on what's called curves attraction. Um, and here we really see that um, there's some necessary input data that we need. The, the way the, the algorithm works is that we assume that we have a given uh, 
some types of singularity with a given magnetic quiver. So just anything that you, that you like, and this describes your modular space. Now what you need to do in order to fill the hazard diagram is actually that you reverse the logic. In terms of Higgs mechanism, you start from the bottom of the Higgs of the, of the Higgs bunch, meaning at the singularity, and then you work your way up. But here we start with the full space, and now we need to figure out what are the possible uh, transfer slices that can appear. And, and the way it's done in quiver subtraction is that you, we need to know the complete list of transfer slices that are allowed, and we need to know their uh, realization in terms of a magnetic quiver which here means that we need to look at this diagram and see, okay, what is a possible, uh, what is a possible slice that we can subtract? And here, um, the example shows us that the possible slice is an E8, because this is the fine uh, E8 Lincoln diagram. And then once we have identified what is the possible slice or what is one of the possible slices that we can subtract, then we start subtracting, literally meaning we align these quivers and we subtract them and we obtain uh, another object. And this other object, again, describes us as symplectic singularity because it has a cooling bunch. And from this algorithm, we can repeat as long, uh, uh, as soon as you, uh, you have to repeat it unless, oh, sorry, you have to repeat it until you hit zero. Uh, that means from this algorithm, you can also derive the Hasse diagram, meaning we start from the full, from the full uh, diagram, we subtracted any eight, which brought us to here. And here we essentially subtract uh, the same quiver to get the zero result which then means we have an A0 field. Of course, as you see, this uh, approach heavily relies on uh, existing knowledge. There is an, as a need to have a complete list. There's a need to know all possible realizations of the same modular space in order to really be sure that the hazard I can compute is correctly computed. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I want to show you uh, how to do or how to derive the hazard diagrams from a brain configuration to give a more physical approach that is valid for uh, theories that have a brain configuration and allows you to compute it at finite as well as infinite. So the example is uh, SP2 with nine flavors. Um, so the brain configuration uh, looks like this and it, everything is in the Higgs bunch phase. So here you would naively read off a magnetic quiver. But now what we want to do, since this describes the, the full, uh, full Higgs bunch, we now need to open a minimal amount of uh, mix or a minimal amount of Coulomb branch directions in five dimensions, meaning we need to transition to a, a mixed branch, but we need to do it in such a way that we do like the smallest possible transition. And the smallest possible transition follows by seeing that here everything is uh, Higgs branch, so nothing you can do, but you can move the 1,1 and the 1,1 minus 1 brains to the left hand side or the right hand side, and then account for brain creation. And brain creation just gives you these blue brains if you want which do not change anything because they're still frozen. There's no new Higgs branch selection. But you can now get the idea that since I have a frozen brain here, which is terminated on this seven brain, and everything here has two, I could start splitting the twos into one plus one, and then start realigning the frozen brain with uh, one brain in each segment. And if I do this, I get, a, I get a consistent brain configuration that looks like this. And I see that my uh, blue five brain is now already transitioned to a mixed branch because now it has a, a distance to the oriented fold. And if I look what, what, uh, what is the physical theory that is described by the blue brain, I see it's an SP1 with seven flavors. I see it's an SP1 because there's a single brain uh, which is away from the oriented fold. And uh, the seven flavors comes by counting how many seven brains are uh, related to this SP1, meaning I have one, two, then this gives me 10, this gives me 11, 12, and then 13, 14 which precisely means SP1 with seven flavors. And you see that the rest of the brain configuration, so everything that is still on the orientative fold is still in the Higgs branch phase, but for now for a smaller theory. So if we translate this information I've shown you in the brain, from the brain configuration now into Hasse diagram, it looks like this. We, we start from the Higgs branch, from the full Higgs branch of SP2 with nine flavors. And we, we opened up the minimal possible uh, direction of the Coulomb branch. And we saw it is uh, the Higgs branch, or the theory is SP1 with seven flavors, which is precisely this piece. So we start from the top and we work our way downwards in, in contrast to the Higgs mechanism that I've shown you before. And we already know SP1 with seven flavors is a D7 singularity. And then from the remaining piece, that, so the, the remaining parts of the um, brain web, which are still in the Higgs branch phase, they describe us uh, D9 singularity. And for all of these, 
um, objects in the Hassel diagram, we have a magnetic quiver description. Because for all these uh, spaces here, so for the uh, SP2, for the slice between SP2 and, and trivial, and SP1 and trivial, we just have the same family of magnetic quivers. And for the uh, slices of scraps of B9, we have precisely this object. And if you, re if you uh, repeat the same uh, argument with quiver subtraction, you find exactly the same aspect. So as now we can actually repeat the same exercise with infinite coupling, uh, which of course is something that you can't do with a, with a, a classical theory. We can't do Higgsing at infinite coupling. But with a brain map, there's no issue in doing it. You take again SP9, SP2 with nine flavors, and we already have seen uh, a similar brain map configuration. Now the question is, how do I open up minimal directions? Uh, because the, the, the complications that these two NS5 brains here, I cannot separate them because they end on the same uh, seven brain. But what I can do, I can um, open these a little bit so I can start bending them to a 2, 1 and a 2, minus 1. And then I have them to be connected to a couple of brains on the left and on the right hand side, which are again denoted in blue. And then the, the, the statement is again that now this object, this blue uh, brain web, is not part of the Higgs branch anymore, but everything that is in black is still in the Higgs branch direction. And we actually have seen this brain web in blue before because there's nothing else than the brain web for SP1 with seven flavors of infinite coupling. So collecting now all the pieces together, we get uh, a, very, a, a new Higgs or a new Hasse diagram, where again, the full space is SP2 with nine flavors infinite coupling. And we started opening up the minimal possible direction, which we have seen is the Higgs branch of infinite coupling of SP1 with seven flavors, which were an EA transition. And the remaining piece or the remaining uh, brains that are on the Higgs branch phase now describe a D10 singularity. And for all of them, again, we have a magnetic quiver description such that the quiver subtraction tells you the same. Okay, now you might ask me, so wh what's the point? Um, why, why do we do this? Um, the, the fun part now becomes that we can start comparing finite versus infinite. So now looking at these Hasselt terms, for instance, for SP1, it's seven flavors. At finite coupling, we know it's just the D7, meaning it's the minimum equivalent orbit of D7. Infinite coupling, we see it's an D8. And we know that this space has an SO14 symmetry, and this space has an E8 symmetry. So we know there's a symmetry enhancement from finite to infinite coupling from SO14 to E8, which is precisely the one we would expect in terms of just speaking about the non abelian part. Similarly, SB2 with nine flavors. We've seen the Hassel diagrams for both cases, and we see they're not the same. Uh, they have different transitions. And we see the bottom part describes as a minimal infinite orbit of uh, D9, which has an SO18 symmetry. And the bottom part of the infinite coupling one has a D10 symmetry, which is the correct symmetry enhancement you would expect with infinite coupling from SO18 to SO20, again, speaking in terms of non abelian symmetry. And that is a consistent feature because we know from a Hasso diagram, we can read off the non abelian part of the global symmetry by looking at the all possible transfer slices which are connected to the origin. And that the U1, um, the U1 instanton is not uh, part of the symmetry of the Higgs branch at finite coupling is, uh, is also not surprising because we know that the U1 uh, instanton symmetry is generated by a Geno bilinear, which at finite coupling is a nilpotent element, so it doesn't contribute to the Kaiser ring at all. And all of these conservations tell you that from the high solar again, first of all, you can read off the global symmetry. And second of all, you can keep track what is happening at the symmetry enhancement at infinite coupling, as well as you also simultaneously keep track of the enhancement of the entire Higgs branch at infinite coupling. So it, it tells you actually much more than just the symmetry enhancement. So doing uh, everything now for the entire class of SPK uh, with uh, nth flavors in five dimensions, you can in, in entertain yourself in uh, sort of coming up with a table. And the table is not for you to remember or to follow this too much. It's just to show you what you can do and what are the possibilities. So here uh, we have what we call the families of E8, E7, E6, E5. What it means is that, for instance, for E8, we know uh, if we have SPK with the maximal allowed numbers of flavors, which is 2K plus 5, then the entire family is what we called uh, E8, because at the case if we go back to SP1, we get the, uh, the E8 case that we know from SP2 with seven flavors. We know that um, for the electric theory, so the one that you would read off from the wind conjugation, there's the one realization that I talked about, which is SPK with uh, 2K plus 5 flavors. 
but there's also due to five reality another uh, um, special unitary realization of the same theory with the same number of flavors, but with a transcendence level. On the other side, from the from the arguments I've shown you, we also have at least two magnetic quivers. We have a unitary magnetic quiver, which comes from the O7 ring construction. And the unitary magnetic quiver is a, a sort of a very nice object because unitary uh, 3D MX4 quivers, they allow you to do full refinement. You can read off the global symmetry just by looking at a subset of balanced nodes. So these are a very convenient tool to work with and many arguments can be made without computing too much. On the other side, from the O5 plane argument, we have seen that we can compute the magnetic quiver, which is autosymmetric, which is still a very, uh, a very nice realization because now we have, for the same uh, modular spaces, we have found at least two magnetic quivers, which describe exactly these modular spaces. And similar arguments hold, of course, for all the other cases. So you can go to E7, which is SPK, with the number of flavors being 2K plus 4. Then you go to E7, uh, E6, which is then uh, the number of flavors reduced by one and so forth. You can reduce this until you have no flavors left. And then you get uh, an, an whole tower of new families, which we call the exception families. And besides just giving you some covers that you know you might think uh, that's not very exciting, you can also detail the entire structure of the Higgs bunch in the Hassel vectors, which is uh, the one part I've shown you before. And you can es essentially do the same. You can look at the Hassel diagrams that find at the infinite coupling, and now you can start comparing. So what are the differences uh, between the uh, IR and the UV? And again, you see there's symmetry enhancement and the symmetry enhancement that we compute from Hassel diagrams and magnetic coolers matches precisely uh, what has been uh, argued in previous, uh, in previous works. And you also see that um, here we see there's a U1 instanton and the U1 instanton gets enhanced uh, inside the SO. But here in the E7 case, this is one of the cases where the U1 instanton actually is independently enhanced to an SU2. And now you can ask me, okay, you told me before that the global symmetry is obtained by the leaf, which, or by the, by the slice, which is connected to the origin. And this is precisely what we see here. At infinite coupling, the Higgs bunch, uh, the, the Hassel diagram is actually more complicated. And we see there's one slice, which has a DK plus four, uh, minimally divided orbit, which gives us the SO4K plus eight global symmetry. Plus there's also a slice connecting to the origin, which has an A1 symmetry which gives us precisely the SU2. So in, in this sense, um, the Hassel diagram uh, can tell you very much about the entire modular space and you can compare it. You can see what are the changes between finite and infinite coupling. Any questions about uh, Hassel diagram so far? Um, yes. So in previous slides, you have a two theory, right? For, for... What do you mean? For for each family, so you have a two 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 description. Is it, is, oh, you mean here? Yeah. Yes. Uh, does it give you the same Hasse diagram? Yes. The, 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 okay. Do they give the yes. same? Okay. But that is the that is uh, that's a very good question because the the point is. Uh huh. Uh, so brain webs. Okay. So there are the multiple approaches to the to the Hasse diagram. Uh -huh. You can work it on the on the on the brain webs. Uh -huh. And on the one hand side, you work with a brain web no orientation folds, and on the other uh -huh. side, you work with brain webs with orientation folds. In both cases, you need to be able to open up uh, minimal amounts uh, to open up a new mixed bunch. Uh -huh. And both of the both of these works are consistent. On the okay. other side, if you want to follow the algorithm with close attraction, you need to have a, a, whole, a, a complete different arsenal to work with. If you want to compute the Hassel diagram from something, yeah, from like this, the yeah. You need to know uh, you need to know a unitary magnetic quiver realization for all the uh, allowed minimal transfer slices, uh -huh. and here you need an autosymplectic realization of mm -hmm. the same modular spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that is the the important part. That if you want to compute the Hasse vacancy, you need to know what are the possible or what are the allowed slices, and uh -huh. you need to know as many quiver realizations as possible. Okay, and it, they give the same uh, Hasse diagram. Correct. That is okay. Correct. Okay, I see. Uh, otherwise, we, we couldn't have written a paper. If, if okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, okay. And you right, spend right. a lot of time to have the same same query. Okay, thanks. Right, right, right. right. Um, okay. So now let me conclude with uh, a sort of a status. So, uh, which is very simple. Um, so for the magnetic quivers, uh, we we started, or the original motivations I showed you is uh, we want to compute the Higgs bundle infinite couple. But now using this technology, we can actually compute the Higgs bunch um, for finite and infinite coupling as well. 
if you, for instance, go to 60, you can compute it at any singular locus of the tensor punch, and you can compute the magnetic quiver, and you can compute uh, what is the Higgs punch. Uh, the magnetic quiver gives you uh, predictions for many, many modular spaces. Of course, the obvious part is it gives you uh, predictions for some of the infinite coupling Higgs branches, but it also gives you predictions for finite coupling Higgs branches, for instance, for all of those which have non-complete Higgsing for which you don't really know what to do if you want to do a hyperkähler quotient. Um, the work so far we have done uh, relies heavily on type two brain constructions, and we have seen if we have no or default presence, we get unitary magnetic covers, which computationally have many advantages. But there's also no uh, reason to be afraid of orientable brains, because we have a working proposal that gives you autosynthetic magnetic covers. They are just a bit more subtle to work with. Uh, but by no means are the magnetic covers uh, restricted to brain constructions, because recently, uh, as um, some may have heard uh, Anja talking about, is that we have now um, enough understanding of modular spaces in Hasselberg games to actually use uh, given information about Higgs branches, for instance, for 4D n equals 1 SCPs, and we can then give a prediction of what a magnetic cover should be just solely based on the properties that we know of the Higgs branches. Likewise, Hassel diagrams have shown you multiple different ways how to get one. Uh, they all are applicable in different settings. So uh, a partial Higgsing for, of course, only works for Lagrangian theory with a finer cup. That is a very physical and intuitive approach, but of course it doesn't help you if you have something more uh, nasty if you want. If you, for instance, have something that has a brain configuration, then we can use uh, so-called craft purchase transitions, which is just a name for opening up minimal amounts uh, of coolant branch directions. And these, of course, are not restricted to finite or infinite coupling. We can just look at the brain configuration. We can take the finite or infinite coupling case and just compute the magnetic quiver. And we can compute the hazard again for each step. Uh, lastly, there's the algorithm that I mentioned and did not elaborate too much about this, which is the quiver subtraction. Um, this is by, um, by claim is a approach to the hazard again, which is even applicable if you don't have a brain construction to work with. However, this construction, of course, relies on many, many input data. Some of them I already mentioned is, uh, is that we need to have a complete understanding. What are the, the allowed transitions that, we are, that can appear in a, in a syntactic singularity? And this basically means that you need to extend the work by Kraft and Pugliese because the modular spaces are not all just minimal nifted orbits. And there's no, mean, there's no reason to, to assume that the slices that were found in uh, minimal nifted orbits are sufficient to cover all possible uh, Higgs branches. So therefore, we need to uh, be open to the uh, possibility that there are new uh, slices, and we've proposed some of the slices in the recent work. And besides knowing what are possible uh, slices, we also need to know many more uh, manifestations of quivers or magnetic quivers, meaning for a given symplectic singularity, uh, it would be very helpful if you know as many quiver realizations as possible. And it can be unitary, it can be autosymplectic, it can be unitary autosymplectic. So it's, it's very important for a given classification of slices to know as many uh, manifestations as possible. And one of the manifestations is precisely these exceptional families, because if you go to the smallest case where we just have an SP1, then we saw that these magnetic rules are precisely some of the allowed uh, minimal transfer slices that uh, already appeared in earlier works. With this, I would like to thank you very much for the attention. And if you have further questions, just let me know. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Um, can I ask one question? Uh, can you go back uh, the two slides? Uh, one more. This one? Mm. Or the other one? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Maybe that's not my question. Um, so, so th that's the, yeah. So the, how the, what is the relation between, a uh, geometrical relation between in, the Higgs branch of the finite coupling and infinite coupling? Uh, how, how, is any, like a, easy way to see the relation between finite and infinite? Um, uh, well, there's, there's some examples, uh, for instance, if you, let me show you this. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, this one. So this here, 
Yes. Um, it's, for instance, one of the 60 examples, uh -huh. um, which is one case where you simply have an uh, E8 instant on transition. Uh -huh. And here you can say that the Higgs function at finite coupling is just given by this piece. Uh -huh. And the Higgs function at infinite coupling is just an addition of uh, the, in, the infinite coupling transition. Uh -huh. Uh, but this doesn't have to be true generically. I mean, there are some cases in 60 where it is true that the, the Higgs bunch at uh, finite coupling is included in the Higgs bunch at infinite coupling. Oh, I but see. if you if you look at these ones, um, here you see the Hasselhoff grams have changed dramatically. I see. Uh huh. Uh, so the, the physically, you would still expect um, that they are included into one another. Uh -huh. uh, but there are many new states that uh, and the symmetry is enhanced, so the, the, the concrete comparison would or the, the comparison would tell you that you have to decompose. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you have, for instance, something like a Hilbert series mm -hmm. for infinite finite coupling, mm -hmm. then of course, what you need to do is you need to decompose the representations of the group at infinite coupling into the representation of I the symmetry group at finite coupling. I and then you, can, then, you, then you should see that all the, um, all the Higgs bunch degrees of freedom from finite coupling are included, plus there are new degrees of freedom, which mm -hmm. then um, arrange themselves uh, accordingly. I see, I see. So there's still an expectation, uh -huh. but from, from here you really need to do a decomposition into representations. I see. Um, and then does a mirror symmetry play an important role in your story in 3D and good 4? If, 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 you, if you go but to if you, 3D, mm -hmm. and reduce to 3D theory in 3D, or, you're talking about 5D, I know. But, um, oh, so, so, okay. For the magnetic quivers in, in yeah. 560, we don't need mirror symmetry. Okay. We just have a brain. If you, if you want to, uh, okay. go to have a brain configuration in 3D, uh -huh. then you can actually do much more. Uh, yes. You can actually write down the Hasser diagram of the full modular space. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means you not only, so this is, remember, this is a Hasser diagram for the Higgs bunch only. Okay. If you go yeah. to 3D, where Coulomb, Higgs bunch, and all the mixed bunches are hypercalar, then uh -huh. you can write down a Hasser diagram for the entire modular space, which contains all the mixed bunches as well. Oh, I see. So this is work of uh, Amiai and one of his students. Uh, okay. And if you have this Hasser diagram, does it tell you about uh, the, for instance, simplex geometry of the moduli space? Like a, where does Lagrangian sit and the topology and so on? Can you study it? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, maybe, maybe it's too difficult. Yeah, that, that, uh, that, I mean, of course, you, you need to turn on FI parameter to blow up the singularity, but... Um, so but here, um, right, right, right. I mean, here we, we, we have no deformation. No, no it's deformation. It's completely singular. Yeah, yeah. Just, it, it's the same exercise for near potent orbit. You just look, yeah. um, you have a synthetic uh, form on, mm -hmm. the, on, the, on the smooth part, Mm -hmm. If you're going to go to the to Sinclair part, you resolve it. You have also a symplectic form, which needs mm -hmm. to reduce correctly. But mm -hmm. if it's on the uh, resolved space, it doesn't have to be uh, non-degenerate. And all the, the possible degenerate loci, loci, they precisely give you all these symplectic peaks. I see. But if you want to look at some Lagrangian sub-matrix, I'm the wrong person to ask. Okay, the wrong person, yeah. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Sorry, I asked too much, maybe. Um, before we finish the, the seminar, uh, I'm thinking about to have this seminar series one hour later to invite more audience from Europe. Uh, there is a function that the, you can raise your hand in, the, in this Zoom. So if you want to have uh, this seminar series one hour later, can you please raise your hand? Um, you want to have, oh, one person lays, lays hand. Good. One hour later. Um, two, two person. Okay. Um, does anybody want to have uh, the, the seminar as it is, like a, it's as it is this, I mean, this, the ordinary time, the one we ha have it today. Okay, there's no, so many opinions. <laughs> okay, I'll think about it. Um, I may change. Uh, next week we will have a schedule, but week after may, I may change the schedule one hour later. Um, so I okay. 
So I will stop recording and then uh, we'll, we'll have some informal discussion. So let's thank the Marcos again. Okay. <laughs>